It should no longer come as a surprise that American society is marked by stark inequality. The circumstances of the Great Recession and the political resonance of the We Are the 99% movement have both underscored this uncomfortable fact. Inequality is worse now than it's been at almost any time in the last century. And it's worse here than in virtually any other democratic and developed economy. Yet for all the jaw-dropping comparisons between rich and poor, between then and now, between the U.S. and everyone else, we hear very little about how and why we got to this point. Our current economic troubles have aimed a spotlight at the problem, but they're not responsible for it. The story of American inequality often features one or both of these plot lines. First, somebody took the money. This version is animated largely by Wall Street greed and the Bush era tax cuts, and features a plutocracy determined to claim more than its share of private wealth and shoulder less than its share of public goods. And second, something happened to the economy. This version has both a backstory the intractable march of globalization and skill-biased technological change, and a more recent plot twist, the Great Recession that began in 2007 and for most of us has not yet ended. These accounts are not so much wrong as they are misleadingly incomplete, inattentive to longer-term historical trends and to the political choices made across that history. The dimensions of that fuller explanation are readily apparent if we consider the political economic, economic conditions that prevailed a generation ago. At that historical moment, the gap between the rich and the poor were much narrower. The gains of economic growth were broadly distributed, and working families, well, at least white working families, enjoyed much greater economic security. Why? Well, first, the political innovations of the New Deal collective bargaining, a minimum wage, new programs for income and retirement security, secured a floor for working class incomes. Second, prevailing patterns of financial regulation, taxation, and corporate governance erected something of a ceiling for higher incomes. And third, substantial public investments in things like the GI Bill, mortgage subsidies, housing projects, the interstate highway system, kept the rest of the structure in pretty good repair. Since then, to put it bluntly, we've pretty much knocked the whole house down. Let's start with the dimensions of the problem. In this respect, snapshots of current wealth or income gaps are less important than historical and comparative patterns. Let's start with wages. Aside from a spike during the boom of the late 1990s, the median wage for all workers has stagnated over the last 30 years. Increased occupational opportunities over the last generation have yielded a modest increase in the median wage for women, while the median wage for men has fallen and is now a dollar less than it was a generation ago. Over this same span, we've seen a growing wage gap based on educational achievement. The median wage for those with less than a high school education has fallen by almost 20% since 1979. The median wage for those with just a high school diploma has fallen slightly. And the median wage for those with a university education has risen by about 20%. In 1979, the median wage for a worker with a university education was about $8 higher than the median wage for a worker who had not graduated high school. Today, that gap is closer to $15 an hour. And we see the same chasm at work in the short term. In the recent recession, and here we're looking at numbers from 2010, both employment security and wages increased dramatically with educational achievement. During the 1970s and the 1980s, the wage gap widened at both ends of the income spectrum. The gap between the poorest 10% of workers and those at the median grew at roughly the same rate as the gap between those at the median and the richest 10% of workers. Since then, the gap has been much more pronounced at the top end. The gap between the poorest and the median is leveled off, 
while the gap between the richest and the median has continued to grow. Wage inequality captures the gap between wage-earning individuals. Let's shift our attention to a more common measure of household income. This includes non-wage forms of income, and it groups individuals into households, the same logic by which our incomes are counted for tax purposes. Here, the basic story is simple and compelling. For the first 30 years after World War II, income for all groups, shown here are the median, the top 5%, and the bottom 20%, closely tracked the expansion of the post-war economy. We were growing together. For the last 30 years, the gains have been starkly unequal. We're growing apart. Research on nearly a century of tax returns confirms this pattern. Here we track the share of income claimed by the top 10% of households. This rose during the roaring 1920s and it fell back slightly with the onset of the Great Depression. It then fell dramatically in response to the political innovations of the New Deal and held at that lower level into the 1970s. As the New Deal was dismantled, however, so too was the relative equality it had, st it had sustained. The share of income claimed by the top 20% has now risen to levels not seen since the 1920s. While these trends can be found across the industrialized world, they are undeniably starker in the United States. In 1980, the share of income in the United States going to the top 1%, the light blue bars in this graph, was on the high side, about 8% but similar to that of its international peers. By 2008, this had ballooned to 18%, sharply higher than that of any of its peers, and more than double the share claimed by the top 1% in most of those other settings. Narrowing our attention to just the last 20 years, the American 1%ers start with a bigger share than that of any of their peers and gain more over that span than any of them. The magnitude of that redistribution is driven home by recent research from the Congressional Budget Office. From 1979 to 2007, the after-tax income of the poorest 20% grew very little, gaining almost nothing in real, that is inflation-adjusted value, from 1979 to the mid-1990s, and inching up only a little since then, for a net gain of about 15%. Incomes for the middle 60% of workers echoed this trend, well, the next 19% did a little bit better. But the lion's share of income growth has gone to the top 1%, whose incomes over that span have almost tripled. A nice way to capture this is the Brandeis Index, a measure of the number of full-time, medium-wage workers that it would take to accumulate the income of an average 1%. In 1980, this ratio stood at 12.5 to 1. By 2007, it had almost tripled and stood then at 36 to 1. Finally, let's turn from income to wealth, a measure that includes savings and investments and debts. Here, the U.S. pattern of inequality is starker still. The top 1% claim about a third of the nation's wealth. The top 5% claim over 60%. The top 10% claim over 70%. The top 20% claim over 80%. The next two percentiles, those falling between the richest 20% and the poorest 40%, together claim a little more than 10%, leaving the poorest 40% with a share of national wealth that is nearly imperceptible on the chart. This distribution of wealth is starkly at odds with that of our international peers. The share claimed by the top 1% in the US comes closer to the share claimed by the top 5% in most other settings. And the share claimed by the top 5% in the US exceeds that claimed by the top 10% in those other settings. 
and the share claimed by the top 10% in the U.S. is, for most of our peers, as close to the median as it is to their top 10%. By any measure, we are a starkly unequal nation. That inequality is exceptional judged against our own history. We are more unequal now than we have been in almost a century. And it is exceptional judged against our international peers. Even in countries where the same trends are found, they are not nearly as pronounced as they are in the United States. Understanding the dimensions of that inequality, of course, is one thing. Understanding its causes is yet another. And we turn to this in part two.